This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. And in those days Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when, Lisa, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on, his, on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Almighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. The Gospel of the Lord. And so, Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, we pray that we would hear not just the words of men, but the words of God. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I want to take that as my text this morning from Luke's uh, Gospel, uh, chapter 1, and beginning at verse 39. If you're making use of the Pew Bible, you can find that text on page 1017. Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, and beginning at verse 39. And this morning I want to talk about Mary. Mary, poor, faithful, happy, and blessed. Mary, poor, faithful, happy, and blessed. Now, that Mary was poor doesn't usually pose a problem for most people. I, I don't think we generally think about her as being poor. Uh, but it doesn't shock us, I don't suppose, when we're reminded of Mary's poverty. And it's not a problem that Mary was faithful, that she was faithful to God. In fact, right, that's central to the story, isn't it? But what about happy and blessed? Indeed, can anyone who's poor, like Mary was, be happy? <laughs> is there anyone who is poor who can be blessed? And I would think that not for a few people, uh, they would uh, perhaps uh, greatly doubt that. And yet Mary describes herself as happy and blessed. But how can that be? Or does Mary know something that we don't. Now our text begins in verse 39 of Luke chapter 1 where we read, and in those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill, crunch, hill country uh, to a town in Judah. But to really understand what's going on, we have to back up and pick up the narrative in verse 26, which if you're using the Pew Bible you'll find not very far away on the next page, I think, or the page before. And there, in ver beginning at verse 26, we read this. In the sixth month, that is the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, and we'll have something more to say about that. Elizabeth and Zechariah were the parents of John the Baptist, and Elizabeth was a, was a relative of Mary. Sometimes this is mentioned in church that actually Jesus and John the Baptist were relatives. But in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee called Nazareth. 
what was famously said of Nazareth, or it was posed in the form of a question, can any good thing come from there? Can any good thing come from Nazareth? But in the sixth month, the angel of Gabriel was sent from God to <laughs> Nazareth, a city of Galilee, to a virgin betrothed by contract to be the wife of a man called Joseph, who was of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary, as we have it in the English text. Her friends would have known her as Miriam. And he came to her and he said, Greetings, O favored one. <laughs> the Lord is with you. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled, Luke says, at this saying, and she tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. In other words, she was scared to death. I mean, she wasn't in the habit or uh, wasn't familiar with, uh, you know, what exactly is the protocols when addressed by an angel. The angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Well, perhaps uh, good things do come from places like Nazareth. <laughs> and he said, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, or Yeshua, as they would have said it in Mary's day, which means Yahweh is salvation. <laughs> and he will be great, Gabriel said, and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom. There will be no end. No end. In fact, this reminded me of uh, what Max Licato says, whether you live to be nine or ninety, life is short, but the kingdom of God lasts forever. And in verse 34, we read, And Mary said to the angel, well, how, how can this be since I'm a virgin? Well, that was a very sensible question to ask. <laughs> and the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High, the power of God, will overshadow you. And therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, set apart, Son of God. And maybe to try to convince her that this is uh, possible, it, the angel said, And behold your relative Elizabeth in her old age, because she was past the age of, of bearing children. In her old age, she has conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her. Things are going well. The pregnancy is going well. The child within her is healthy and good. This is the sixth month. No miscarriage. This is the sixth month with her who was called barren. And so Gabriel says, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, in fact, she might have said, I don't understand anything what you said. <laughs> I don't know what you mean by any of that. However, Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. I don't understand any of what you... I asked you a simple question. You gave me that. I don't know what that means. But I do know what you said God wants to do. And I am your, his servant for him to do as he sees fit. He, she, Mary, as is sometimes... She is sometimes referred to as the first disciple. And perhaps the best. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your will. And then Luke says, And the angel departed from her. This then brings us to the beginning of our text in verse 39. And so we read, And in those days, what days? Like when this happened. <laughs> in those days Mary arose. Where do you suppose she went? And she went in haste. She was excited. 
In those days Mary arose and she went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. The hill country in Judah would have been south of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is at the northern point of Judah. And of course Jerusalem is on a hill and there's a, just a, long, a range there of hills. And the, the, the Judean hills which south of Jerusalem. She went to a town that's not named but we are. But the residents of the town and the house where she went is identified are identified, to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, and greeted Elizabeth, her cousin. You can imagine, she shows up, she's a teenage girl, I wonder, I, I have to imagine that there was somebody with her to make what would have been about a 70 mile journey, which would have taken a couple, two or three days, uh, to get from where she was in the north in the Galilee. But she enters the house and she says, Shalom! <laughs> In verse 41, And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby in her womb leaped. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> In fact, it's very interesting in Luke's writings, in the Gospel of Luke or in Acts, oftentimes this is an indication. Now pay attention because something's coming. And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said, are full of the Holy Spirit, they did such and such. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And notice, now all of a sudden, she, she hasn't, all she's heard is, Shalom. But she seems to know a whole lot about what had happened and what Mary would have got around to saying if she had had time, but the Holy Spirit beat her to it. And so she, Elizabeth exclaims with a loud voice. Notice what she says. Blessed are you among women. Or in the New Living Translation, which is really good because it kind of catches the, 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 the Hebraic idea behind the Greek, which is this sort of a setting up of a superlative. In the New Living Translation, it says, God has blessed you above all women. You are the most blessed of all. Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And then notice her humility. And, and why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord, how does she know that she's the mother of the Lord, the Messiah, the Mashiach? And why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord, my little teenage cousin, should come to me? And Elizabeth continues, For behold, she says, when the sound of your greeting, Shalom, entered my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she, in other words, blessed are you, who believed that there would be a fulfillment, that it would come to pass what was spoken to her from the Lord. How does she know <laughs> Because of the moving and the filling of the Spirit. Blessed is she who believed. How interesting. Mary's from Nazareth. A peasant girl. She was the sort of person that Jesus put that part in the prayer in for people like her and give us this day our daily bread. I don't know. You know, when you, when you pray the Lord's Prayer, doesn't that, that one's probably of all the parts of the prayer is the, less grip, the, the least gripping. Give us this day our daily bread. You go into your pantry, you it, it, daily bread. I mean, are you like us? I mean, we buy stuff we've already got because we didn't know we had it. It's like, check the, uh, oh, I just bought mayonnaise. Would you check the date on this mayonnaise? Well, I think, well, I think we, it kind of looks a little yellow. Isn't it supposed to be white? Boop. Into the garbage it goes, right? Give us this day our daily bread. That was the kind of prayer 
that Mary prayed. But she's blessed. Why? Because she believes. Not because she understood what God, how God was going to do what He said He wanted to do. But she trusted Him. It's interesting when Jesus says, if anyone would enter the kingdom of God, they must do so as a child. Just trust me. You wouldn't understand if I explained it to you. Just trust me. Trust me. Trust me. And so Mary is blessed because she believes. This reminded me, of course, what Jesus said to Thomas. You remember Jesus who appeared after the crucifixion as, a, as a, a, a raised alive. The, the disciples didn't experience the resurrection, but they experienced the resurrected Christ. And Thomas wasn't there when he appeared first, as John describes it. And, and so uh, Thomas comes around and the rest said, you can't believe it, we've seen the Lord. And Thomas says, I won't believe unless I see him with mine own eyes and, 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 and put my fingers into the, the nail prints in his hands and, and put my hand in his side. And, and that evidence must be produced in order for me to believe. And of course, Jesus the following week shows up and Thomas is there and Jesus says, Thomas, here, touch my hands and so on. And of course, Thomas fell to his knees and said, my Lord and my God. And then in verse 29 of that 20th chapter of John, and Jesus, we read, and Jesus said to Thomas, Thomas, you have believed because you have seen me. Blessed, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's significant, I think, because that's exactly what, how Mary believed. She hadn't known. Oh, well, you know, let's see, this is virgin birth number 109 in my book. She didn't know what this was, but God came and she believed. And then in verse 46, Mary breaks out in song. Now notice that this is a girl who goes to synagogue all the time. This is, a, this is a place where, they, don't have, they didn't have Netflix or some other such form of entertainment. Their entertainment and their life was centered around the stories of, of the Bible and the phrases of the Bible. And they didn't have, most of them didn't have writing utensils and, and so forth. And many of them, many of them were, wouldn't know how to use them if they were. They were illiterate, but they had great ears. And great memories for hearing these phrases that they heard over and over. It wouldn't have been difficult for someone like Mary, as devout indeed as she was as well, to throw something together with phrases, with, with, uh, phrases that she was familiar with. In fact, there's about 15 or 16 different references, Bible references that you find in her song. But in verse 46, and it says uh, that Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. I've heard from Gabriel. I turned up in Elizabeth. She wasn't even there. She knows all about it. The baby is leaping in her womb. A, one, a baby she shouldn't have because she's too old to have a child. But there's nothing impossible for God. My soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the whole humble estate of his servant. <laughs> Me, uh, Mary, in Nazareth, a town scorned by the rest of the country. Even in Galilee they talk about Nazareth. She's a poor peasant girl from Nazareth. But you know who she is? <laughs> She's God's servant. Not only according to God elect, God's elective purposes, but by choice. God came and she said, yes, of course. <laughs> and Mary continues, and behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. <laughs> and we are. We have every generation. The blessed virgin. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Those who fear him. Those who reverence him. 
Those who obey him. Like Mary. Verse 51, God has shown the strength of his arm. He scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. Made me think of the Apostle Peter's admonition to the church. In 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning at verse 5, he says, And now all of you believers in Christ, clothe yourselves with humility. <laughs> clothe yourselves. It's like putting, put humility on and wear it. Clothe yourselves with humility. For, Peter says, God opposes the proud. Are you proud? Get over it. That is a bad spot to be in. You think it's just between you and the people that you have disagreements with. God doesn't like that. Right? You have heard, oh man, what God requires of you. Right? Micah 6 and verse 8. To, to do justice and to love mercy and to what? Walk humbly with your God. And if, you, and if you have a hard time being humble, you're not paying enough attention to yourself. <laughs> There's plenty of reasons why you should be humble. If you're anything like me, <laughs> you just need to little, lick a little closer. Man, we are finite. I, 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 the, and it seems the older you get, the more mistakes you make. There's plenty to be humble about. We're imperfect. And all of you clothe yourselves with humility, for God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. That's what Mary said. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at, pro at the proper time he may exalt you. <laughs> and so Mary says, and God has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud and the thoughts, the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and has exalted those of humble estate <laughs> like her. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. Jesus in his famous sermon on the plain, he himself, he says similar things. In fact, what I'm going to read may shock you. You might have read when you were reading Luke, read through this rather quickly. Maybe you assumed you knew what it meant. Or maybe you didn't. But in Luke chapter 6 and beginning at verse 12, we read, And Jesus went up to a mountain to pray, in the Galilee, of course, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when the day came, he called his disciples, and he came down with them and stood on a level place. This is why this is called the Sermon on the Plain. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. From the north, from the south they came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Verse 20, and Jesus lifted up his eyes on his disciples and he said, Blessed are you who are poor. No, he didn't say that. He didn't say that. Well, yeah, he did. Blessed are you who are poor. And there would have been a whole lot of poor people there. <laughs> Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. <laughs> Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man, on the account of me, your association with me, you're serving me. 
Rejoice in that day and leap, <laughs> leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. But then notice what he said. Verse 24. But woe to you who are rich. For you've received your consolation. Enjoy it, man. <laughs> it's, like, it's like Dives and Lazarus, right? That's what Abraham said. Both Lazarus, the poor man who was put at, at the rich man's gate every day and the rich man didn't do anything and the rich man lived in the lap of luxury and he enjoyed his life and people in the community said, yeah, man, he's, that guy is awesome. I want to be like him. And then they both died. And then Lazarus was seated at the place of honor next to Abraham in paradise. And there was a great chasm. And on the other side of the chasm was the rich man. And the rich man calls out to Abraham in his agony. And he says, Abraham, tell Lazarus to dip his finger in the water and to touch my tongue to give me some relief because I'm in an agony in this flame. And Abraham says, well, son, you know, you remember your life and you had all your good things and Lazarus had bad but now Lazarus is comforted and you are in your agony you know who told that story? Jesus the same one who said this woe to you who are rich for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. And woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. Perhaps you noticed in all of this that God defines blessedness a great deal differently than most people do. In fact, you may have noticed that true blessedness, as God defines it, is in fact the very opposite of what most people think of when they think of the meaning of true blessedness. And still, most people, even many Christians, prefer their definition to God's. <laughs> and their definition and their pursuit of it, such as the more you have, the happier you will be, is taking them to the place that God said it will take them to. And so I wonder, how do you define blessedness? And where is your definition taking you? Jesus, or Mary, I should say. Mary, poor, faithful, happy, and blessed. Let us pray. I'm just thinking now, Lord, of uh, Jesus uh, saying, and not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. What do you mean, Lord? What do you mean? They love you. They know you. No, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And it's a frightful thing to think, Lord, that Jesus should say on the day of his return and the setting up of his kingdom that he should say to any one of us, depart from me for I never knew you. And then we say, but Lord, but Lord, I was a member at the church and I did this and I, 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 I pledged and, and will be surprised. In fact, not a one of them is not surprised. That has to mean, Lord, that we were deceived and we just lived that deception. But in Mary, we see something true and beautiful just as 
you saw her as true and beautiful, full of faith, and filled with joy, notwithstanding what we might, have, we might describe as very difficult circumstances. And yet that's how you often work. Lord, help us to be aware of that and to not miss it. We have everything to gain and nothing to lose because the real thing is always better than a counterfeit. And so, Lord, I pray that our faith would be true, not a counterfeit, not just words, but true spiritual authenticity in all that goes along with it, living for you in public as well as private in a way that you would say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.